Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the St. Louis Java Users Group. This is the February 2022 edition. For those who don't know, the St. Louis Java Users Group is an informal group. Attendance is free. There is no formal membership list. Normally, we meet on the second Thursday of every month, except December, uh, when there is no meeting. There's just too many things going on over the holidays for us to be able to organize a meeting uh, in December. When we meet in person, you can join us for food and social at 6 p.m. The meeting starts at 6.30 p.m. And when we meet in person, our normal meeting location is the Object Computing Incorporated Training Room at 12,140 Woodcrest Executive Drive, Suite 310 in St. Louis, Missouri. I'd like to introduce you to the rest of the members of our steering committee. So from left to right, we have Ted Doyle, Todd Zimmerman, Bruce Allspaw, that's me in the middle, Wei Chi Gao, and Kathy Swang. You can reach all of us on the steering committee if you just send an email to that address there that's on the bottom of your screen. That's javasigsc at ociweb.com. The St. Louis Java Users Group would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. And so I have the logos up for uh, our important sponsors. Object Computing Incorporated is our original founding sponsor. They have been with us since 1997 uh, when the group has formed. Uh, they provide the training room uh, right now and they fill in whenever we have gaps in our other sponsorship. And so we really appreciate their support and staying with us all these, all these years. JFrog has been a great sponsor. They cover the cost for the Zoom subscription, uh, which makes the remote meetings possible so that you can attend them now. We, we'd like to thank you for that. Signature Consultants and Adaptive Solutions Group are headhunters. So if you're looking for a Java position or if you have a Java position that you would like to fill, just do a quick Google search, contact them, and let them know that you found out about us through the St. Louis Java Users Group. They're great folks to work with. At the end of the meeting, we will be raffling two JetBrains licenses for a product of your choice. And uh, they've been with us here for quite some time as well. Sorry, you must be present to win, though, and that'll be after the presentation. Elastic, uh, when we meet in person, has some gift cards. Hopefully they haven't expired yet, but we've just been holding on to those until we meet in person. And the same thing goes for Intertech. Uh, they supply the famous screaming flying monkeys, coffee cups, uh, uh, mouse pads, and so forth. Now, they are a training company. So if you're looking to improve your skills, you can just do a quick Google search for Intertech and they have a lot of nice training programs as well. And what those screaming flying monkeys are, they're just little monkey dolls. And uh, if you throw them up against the wall, uh, they scream and they're a lot of fun. At the end of the program, Manning will, will be sponsoring two Manning eBooks uh, of your choice. Again, you must be present to win. And they've also gone the extra mile and they've provided a speaker for us here tonight. And we'll be hearing from him shortly. And the folks at Pearson will often sponsor physical books as well. So thank you. And we appreciate the support from all of our JUG sponsors. As far as announcements go, the Gateway Software Symposium is coming up and it will be at the St. Louis Marriott West. 660 Maryville Center, Center Drive in, in St. Louis. Now there's a remote option and an online option. So I think you can attend both ways. And I believe I sent out a, an email to the list where there's like discounts for like the first, uh, you know, people who can get them. There's a discount code so you can save some money if you want to register now. And I would encourage you to do so. So that'll be coming up here. Uh, in, not too far in the future here, April 1st and 2nd. Also, DevNexus in Atlanta is coming up. That is one of the largest Java conference in North America. 
And that will be April 12th through the 14th in Atlanta. Registration is open and they will have workshops and everything. As far as I know, they're going to try to do that one in person. Uh, we'll see if that still holds. But at least for now, uh, it is coming up and you can get the details there at that email at that at that website there, devnexus.org. Next month, we've got a presentation scheduled on GraphQL by uh, Quito Mann of Virtua, who's another book author. So yes, thank you, we're looking forward to that one. And if you'd like to give a presentation, uh, just contact us here at that email address on the screen there, javasigsc at ociweb.com. Send us your bio and abstract and we'll see if we can get you on our meeting schedule. If you wanna see our schedule as it develops, just go to the meetup page. That's meetup.com slash gateway jug. And as we schedule presentations, they'll be posted on meetup. So you can watch as, uh, as we, so as they're scheduled, they just show up there on our, on our meetup site. So that's all the announcements that I have. Uh, for tonight's presentation, we have a Manning book author here, Unit Testing Principles, Patterns, and Practices. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here at this point. So uh, Vlad, I think you can take over the screen now. And uh, why don't you go ahead and take it away? I think you should see it now. All right, so yeah, um, as you already heard, uh, this presentation is going to be about unit testing principles, practices, and patterns. And just a couple of words about myself. As you all also heard, I have a book on, uh, with the same title, and I also have several courses on Plural Life. So, uh, the agenda for this talk is going to be the following. First, we will talk about how to measure the effectiveness of a test. Then we'll discuss how to put this knowledge to practice and how to actually write effective tests. And then we'll talk about when you should and when you shouldn't use models. So um, how to measure the effectiveness of your tests. When we talk about, um, unfortunately, there is no way to uh, do this automatically. There's no way, there's no automated way to do so. And when we're talking about automated way to measure the test effectiveness, we're usually thinking about test coverage. Unfortunately, test coverage is not um, a sufficient metric. And that's because test coverage is a good negative indicator, but it is a bad positive indicator. And it means that um, when you have a low test coverage, uh, let's say something uh, anywhere uh, less than uh, 40 or 50%, it means that you don't test enough. Your project doesn't have enough tests. But even if you have a high uh, coverage number, uh, 90 or even 100%, it doesn't necessarily mean that your tests are of good quality. So the test coverage metric uh, is, uh, um, uh, necessary but not a sufficient indicator. And the only way to evaluate your tests is to do that manually and uh, evaluate, evaluate all your tests uh, individually, separately. So how to do this? To uh, evaluate your test, we need four components. The first one is protection against bugs. And the second one, resilience to refactoring, fast feedback and maintainability. Let's first talk about the second two components, the last two components, uh, just because they are easier to describe, and then we'll come back to the first two. Uh, fast feedback is pretty self-explanatory. It means that uh, the, uh, it, it shows how fast your test executes. And it's important because the faster your test is, the easier it is to fix um, uh, the bug that this test reveals. And we all know that the same bug that is found in production is orders of magnitude uh, harder to fix, more costly to fix than this same bug found during development. So when you push these uh, bugs to the later stages of your development, they become more and more costly to fix. 
That's why the uh, speed of your tests and the speed of the feedback you get from those tests is important. The next metric, the, ma the next component is maintainability. And this component it consists of two subcomponents. The first one is how easy it is to understand the test. And the second one is how easy it is to run the test. So the first subcomponent is a function of the size and the clarity of the test. So basically, the smaller the test is, the easy it is to understand that test and easy it is to, uh, to maintain and uh, uh, update and change that test later if needed. And of course, uh, it's not only the size of the test that matters, but also the clarity of, the of this test. If your test is small, let's say it's just a couple lines of code, but if you need to scroll uh, your screen um, five uh, screens to the right in order to see uh, the full test code, then it's not a good test. And the second subcomponent, how easy it is to run the test, is a function of the number of out-of-process dependencies that this test works with, such dependencies as the database, the message bus, and so on. And um, it's important because the more such dependencies your test uh, need to work with, the harder it is to, to maintain your test because you need to keep those dependencies operational. You have to reboot your database from time to time. You have to uh, make sure that your network uh, doesn't have any issues and so on and so forth. So these are the third and the fourth components. The first component is the uh, is protection against bugs. And this component depends on the amount of code that gets executed by the test. So the more code the test executes, the higher the chance is that this test will reveal a bug in this uh, code. And it's also important to not, um, so it's not only the amount of code that's important, but also the type of code. So how complex or important that code is. And that's because uh, the you know, critical bugs, critical issues tend to appear in the business logic or in some complex algorithms. And so you need to cover those um, types of code uh, first and foremost. And finally, it's also uh, important to cover not just your code, but also code that you didn't write, um, such as external libraries and systems that your code works with. And that's important because uh, your code doesn't work in a vacuum. It works with other subcomponents, other subsystems, or other systems. And bugs often uh, appear not in just your code, but in integration between your code and external systems. The second component of a good test is resilience to refactoring. And that's the most interesting component, in my opinion. So resilience to refactoring depends on the number of false alarms that your test raises during uh, refactoring of their underlying code base. So basically, a false alarm is the same as a false positive and the same as a false failure. It's when your test says that there is a bug in the code, but in fact, in the reality, there's no bugs in the code. And why this is important? Uh, it is important because false alarms affect your ability to refactor your code. And, uh, and the lack of false positives, false alarms uh, is important because the refactoring itself is important. You have to do refactoring in order to prevent your code from decaying. And code tends to decay over time uh, because um, let's say you have to, um, you introduce some hacks into this code, maybe the requirements change over time and you don't have time to adjust the architecture of your code to match the new requirements. So because of all that, your code uh, quality, uh, quality tends to deteriorate. And in order to prevent this, you need to do continuous maintenance of this code, continuous refactoring. And if your tests uh, constantly raise false alarms, you uh, basically start to lose trust in those tests and you are becoming much more hesitant to refactor your test because you don't know if you introduce a bug and whether your tests will actually reveal those bugs or uh, they will just uh, cry wolf all the time. Uh, 
So you will not be able to differentiate basically between false positives and true positives because you will slowly lose trust in your tests. So why uh, false positives takes, uh, take place? They are a result of how you structure your tests. Um, so um, uh, they are a result of coupling your tests to implementation details. The more you couple your tests to implementation details, the more those tests will break when you change those implementation details. And let's take an example. This example is in C-sharp, but it's pretty simple code. So it's basically the same as in Java. Uh, here we can see several classes. The first one is uh, the message class <clears throat> that consists of uh, the header, the body, and the footer. And we also have an iRender interface with a single method render that takes in a message instance and then returns an HTML representation of that message. Uh, with a string. And then we have a message render class that implements that I render interface. And it also has this render uh, method that takes a message as an argument and returns a string <clears throat> HTML representation of that message. And what it does internally, it uh, delegates the work on that message to sub renders and then compiles the resulting uh, messages into one message and returns it, to, uh, returns it to the caller. And here are the sub renders. Nothing special here. They just take the message, uh, a message instance as an argument and then work on some parts of that message and wrap them into HTML tags. So uh, the question is how to test this message renderer class. And there are two ways to do so. The first one is to check the collection, the content of this sub renderers collection. And if we uh, see that this content, uh, the collection contains the correct sub renderers, then we can also assume that the behavior of this class of this message renderer class is also correct. So this is how the test how a corresponding test may look. Uh, here we instantiate the message renderer, then we get its sub renders, and then we check that the number of those sub renders is correct and the type of those sub renders is also correct. This is called structural inspection and it is an anti pattern. And it is an anti pattern because this test couples to implementation details. And as a result, it becomes fragile. So uh, here, for example, uh, we can modify uh, the collection of sub renderers such that we can, well, we can rearrange that collection or we can replace one of those sub renderers with another sub renderer uh, without modifying the observable behavior of this class. Or we can e even remove all those sub renderers and implement all this functionality in the message renderer class itself. And still, th this test will break regardless of whether we um, uh, did the refactoring correctly or not. And that's because uh, that's precisely because this test couples to implementation details and not to observable behavior of this class. Here's another example. And uh, what this test does is it reads the content of the message renderer class and then checks that this uh, checks that its implementation is correct, so to speak. And this is, of course, a contrived example. It's basically a ridiculous example. You never want to do this, but it's not that different from the previous example because both this version of the test and the previous version of the test, they both insist on a particular implementation of the message renderer class, and they both will break if you modify that implementation, even if the behavior of that class remains the same. Admittedly though, this, a version of the test will break more often because here you can just put any line or any space and uh, this test will break, but still it's not that different from the previous version. <laughs> and this uh, is called struct, um, source code inspection and it is also anti-pattern also because it leads to fragile tests. So to avoid false alarms, to avoid test fragility, uh, you need to couple your tests to the end result and not to implementation details. So in our example, instead of 
checking the content of the sub renders collection, we need to check the end result that this render method generates. And this is how the test will look. Uh, so here we also instantiate a message render instance. We supply it with some message, uh, some sample message, and then we check the result in HTML. And this uh, test doesn't uh, couple to implementation details because it verifies the end result. The end result here is the HTML representation of some message. Uh, so um, uh, when, uh, this is the end result because uh, it's the only thing that matters for the end user. Uh, the only thing that matters here is how this message is represented on uh, in the browser. It doesn't really matter for the customer or for the client how exactly the message renderer plus implements this functionality. And here we get this picture. Uh, so this difference between coupling to implementation details and coupling to end result can be represented as this picture. So a good test answers the question of, is the end result correct? Whereas a bad test answers the question of, is the process correct? And the process in our previous example was the uh, content of the sub renders collection. And the end result is the uh, HTML output, HTML, HTML representation of the message. So these are the four components again. Uh, and the first two components, protection against bugs and resilience to refactoring, they are related to each other in an interesting way. So they form this test accuracy metric, which can be represented as a single to noise ratio. So this signal part is the number of bugs that the test can find. And the noise part is the number of false alarm that the test raises when it finds all those bugs. And the first component, uh, protection against bugs, is responsible for the signal part, basically how many, uh, how many bugs the test can find. And the second component, uh, resilience to refactoring, is, re is responsible for the noise part. And both of these parts, both of these metrics are important uh, because if your test is not capable of finding any bugs, then obviously this test is, is useless. And also, even if this test is, uh, well, even if, even if it can find all the bugs in the code, if it does this with a lot of noise, then its value or accuracy also tends to zero. It's also, uh, it also becomes useless because you are not able to differentiate between those true signal, uh, true positives and false signal, false positives. So all this signal is lost in the noise, basically. You can think of these two metrics of signal and noise as of um, uh, signal is uh, signal tells you how uh, good your test is at um, at indicating the presence of bugs, and the noise tells you how good your test is at indicating the absence of bugs. And as I said, all of these both of these metrics are critically important. <laughs> in my experience. A lot of people, a lot of developers pay proper attention to the uh, first, third, and fourth components to protection against bugs, uh, fast feedback, and maintainability, but they don't pay proper attention to resilience to refactoring to the second component. And a lot of problems with code stem from uh, this fact, this lack of attention to the second component, and why that is so. We can uh, we can build we can put the effect of false negatives and false positives on the project with uh, on, on this diagram. So here, there are two lines. The upper line are, uh, represents false negatives uh, and uh, the uh, lower line is false positives. So again, false negatives is when the test says that there is no bugs in code, but there are in fact are bugs in code. So when the test cannot find a bug. And the uh, false positives are the opposite of that. It's when the test says that there are bugs, there are no bugs in code. Uh, sorry, uh, it's when there um, there are when the test says that there is a bug in code, but in fact there are no bugs in code. So false negatives is the area uh, of responsibility of the first component, and false positives is about the second component. 
And this diagram shows the importance of these two, uh, of these uh, two uh, uh, phenomena on the test suite. So false negatives become important pretty much from the very beginning. Um, and that's because you do want your tests to find bugs. And that's basically the main reason why you write those tests. And you do want to do, uh, you do want your tests to do, to do that pretty much from the very beginning. So the importance of for false negatives is, uh, is pretty much immediate, but it's not the case for false positives. And that's because um, uh, the importance of refactoring in your project is not immediate either. Uh, when you're just starting your uh, project, your code is pretty much flawless, it's shiny, it doesn't need a lot of refactoring. And so uh, the importance of false positives is not immediate either, because uh, false positives come up when you refactor your underlying code base. But if you evolve your project on, um, uh, if your project becomes uh, complex or uh, long enough on that scale, on that time scale, and false positives become as important as false negatives. And a lot of developers neglect uh, the second component, which is false positives, because not many projects come to that later stage when the false positives or refactoring of your code base becomes important. But again, uh, on, uh, on a large enough scale, time scale, uh, both of these metrics are almost equally important. And we can also discuss the relation between the first three components of this um, of these four metrics. So protection against bugs, resilience to refactoring, and fast feedback. They are related uh, in such a way that you cannot maximize all three of them. You can maximize only two of them at the expense of the third one. So let's take some examples. The first example is end-to-end -end tests. End-to-end -end tests are tests that cover all of your code, including external dependencies, such as, uh, for example, uh, the database, the payment gateway, and so on and so forth. End-to-end -end tests give you the best protection against bugs. That's because uh, they execute a lot of code and not just your code, but also the code of external dependencies. So they have the highest chance of revealing an issue with your code. They also have the best resilience to refactoring because uh, uh, if you refactor your code and if you do that correctly, uh, this refactoring doesn't affect the uh, uh, the uh, doesn't doesn't affect how your system behaves to the client to the end user, and because end-to-end -end tests emulate that end user, they uh, don't um, they are not affected either. The only problem with end-to-end -end tests is that they are slow. They provide you with slow feedback. And if we put the first three uh, components on a diagram, then the end-to-end -end tests will get into this intersection between resilience to refactoring and protection against bugs. Um, so they do provide you with a good resilience to refactoring and protection against bugs, but they don't give you fast feedback. The, uh, the second example of maximizing two components out of three is trivial tests. Trivial tests are tests that cover some trivial functionality. So here on the left, you can see a user class with a simple name uh, property that doesn't have any logic in it. And on the right, you can see a test that just assigns some string to that name uh, property and then checks that the string is correct. So uh, this test gives you fast feedback because it executes fast and it also go have good resilience to refactoring, but it doesn't give you good protection against bugs. And that's just because there's not, um, there's not much room for a mistake in the user class because this user class itself is quite trivial. So we can put the, uh, this type of tests into this bucket. Uh, it gives you fast feedback gives you uh, resilience to refactoring, but it doesn't give you uh, protection against bugs. And also we can come up with a third example uh, with a third bucket, and that is fragile tests. So we already saw an example with the uh, message renderer class, an example of a fragile test. And here is another example. So on the left, we have a user repository uh, that um, contains just one method, get by ID, and this 
a repository records the last executed SQL statement into this property, last ex executed SQL. And on the right, we can see a test that instantiates this repository, um, tries to get a user by ID five, and then checks that the last executed state, SQL statement is the same as uh, this test expects. So uh, this test gives you fast feedback and it also gives you good protection against bugs, but the problem with this test is that it's not, uh, it is fragile. It it's, doesn't have good resilience to refactoring. And that's because there are a multitude of different options of how exactly you can query the user data. For example, here you can see uh, the four alternatives for this uh, SQL statement and they all will provide you with the same result. Uh, but still, if you modify the SQL statement to any of those four alternatives, this test, uh, this test will break even though the observable behavior will not change. And so it will break uh, because it couples to implementation details. So we can put fragile tests into this bucket uh, between protection against bugs and fast feedback, but with the lack of resilience to refactoring. Unfortunately, this ideal in the intersection between the uh, first three components is unreachable. Uh, you cannot have tests that maximize all three of these components. But uh, it's possible to get quite close to this ideal, even though the ideal itself is unreachable. So let's discuss how to do this. Um, so we discussed how to measure the effectiveness of a test using the four components. And now let's talk about how to write effective tests. In order to write effective tests, you need to refactor the underlying code. Unfortunately, there is no way around it because your tests are inherently connected to the code that uh, these tests cover. And we can, uh, all code can be categorized alongside two dimensions. The first dimension is complexity and importance. And the second dimension is the number of collaborators. So complexity, uh, basically uh, uh, co complex code is uh, uh, some algorithms or some complex business logic and important code is, um, for example, your domain logic, your business logic. So some code that's not necessarily complex, but it is important for your business. And it's important um, uh, it, the tests that cover such code give you the best value uh, because they provide you with the best protection against bugs. And that's because uh, the most critical bugs tend to appear in either complex or important code. And you need to cover that code um, uh, uh, for, uh, first and foremost. Next, uh, we have this dimension uh, of the number of collaborators and the collaborator is a dependency that is mutable. So for example, if you test a user class and this class has a dependency on another class called company, and if that company class is mutable, then it would become a collaborator for the user class. Um, so uh, tests that cover uh, code with a large number of collaborators, they uh, are, uh, they become highly, uh, uh, th their maintenance costs is high. And that's because you will have to uh, arrange all those collaborators in those tests and then maybe uh, check the communication between the system under test and those collaborators. And uh, also maybe check uh, the state of those collaborators after the test is completed. So it all inflates the size of your test, which makes the test itself is, uh, makes the test itself um, unmaintainable, less maintainable. And it also not only the number of collaborators that matters here, but also the type of those collaborators. For example, if your test, um, if the system under test works with the database and you test that database directly, then it also becomes um, even less uh, maintainable because you have to keep those out of process dependencies operational. <laughs> so we can use these two dimensions to plot uh, your code on this diagram. So on the x, on the y axis, we have the complexity and domain significance. And on the x axis, we have the number of collaborators. 
And uh, this gives us these four quadrants on the top left quadrant. Uh, we have domain model and algorithms, and that is uh, basically business logic of your application or some complex algorithmic code. Uh, this is uh, this code is either complex or significant for your domain, important. And at the same time, this code doesn't have a large number of collaborators. Ideally, it shouldn't have any. Also, uh, on the bottom left, we have trivial codes. So example here uh, uh, could be some uh, method that uh, just does some setting or a get method uh, or a property in C-sharp. Or for example, uh, an instructor that doesn't do any complex work uh, and just assigns some values to private fields. On the bottom right, we have controllers. And controllers is the code that doesn't do any complex work on its own, but delegates the work to other components. Uh, basically, it's, it orchestrates the work with between different parts of your system, usually between the domain model and some external services. And finally, at the uh, top uh, uh, right quadrant, we have overcomplicated code. And this is the code that is both complex and also has large number of collaborators. Uh, an example here would be uh, a FAT controller anti-pattern. This is an anti-pattern um, because this controller doesn't delegate any work anywhere, but does all that work um, uh, itself on its own. And um, so in terms of unit testing, the coverage of the uh, top left quadrant gives you the best value. So the coverage of your domain model and algorithm, algorithms. The resulting tests become cheap and uh, highly valuable. They are cheap because the underlying code doesn't have a lot of collaborators. And so you don't need to set them up in tests. And uh, those tests are valuable because the code itself is complex or important. So uh, these tests give you uh, the best chance of finding a critical issue. Trivial code is not worth covering at all. So um, it doesn't give you enough value to, um, uh, to basically spend your time on covering that code. So I just I would recommend to just skipping that part altogether. Controllers uh, need, they do need testing, but they need, um, you can test them with a much smaller set of integration tests. And finally, the most problematic part uh, is the overcomplicated code. And uh, this is one of the main reasons why people have issues with their testing, with their test suites, is because they have a lot of this overcomplicated code, which is uh, both important and also has a large number of collaborators. <laughs> and this is this code is problematic because it's, um, uh, it's risky to leave it without test coverage, but at the same time, it's hard to test it because of the large number of collaborators. Um, and in order to make your code testable, you need to refactor that overcomplicated code into two parts. You need to split it into parts. The first is domain model and uh, the algorithms, and the second part is controllers and how to do that. To do this, uh, we can use the humble object design pattern. Um, so this pattern is, uh, well, uh, if you have some overcomplicated code, it's because it combines inside uh, the logic part. So some algorithm, some complex, some complexity and a hard to test dependency. And the humble object tells us that we need to split these two components and uh, so that they become dependent from each other and then wrap them into a humble object that wouldn't do any work on its own, but would orchestrate the work between these two components. And that humble object is the same as the uh, controllers in our, uh, four, uh, in our diagram with the four quadrants. So as a result, you will be able to test this logic part in isolation from the hard to test dependency and you will also be able to cover your humble object or your controllers with a smaller set of integration tests. And there is a good metaphor uh, to visualize this guideline. So uh, we can represent our code 
as this rectangle where the width of the, of the rectangle tells us how many dependencies this code works with and the height of these rectangles tells us uh, how complex this code is. So here the controller um, is represented with a, a white by, but short rectangle because it, uh, it, uh, the, um, because it works with a lot of collaborators, but in itself, it's not that complex. That's why it is short. On the other hand, domain model and algorithms are displayed as tall rectangles because they are complex, but they are narrow because they don't work with a lot of uh, dependencies. And so the guideline here is that your code should be either white or tall, but not both at the same time. Or another way to put this is that the more complex your code is, the fewer dependencies it should work with. So this is the, co uh, this is the guideline you need to adhere when you uh, uh, refactor your code to make it more testable. And this humble uh, object pattern, it's actually nothing new uh, because this pattern uh, comes up a lot in the wild. And one of the most uh, widely known pattern that implements this same idea is the MVC pattern, the model view controller. And here, uh, this is basically the same thing. The model here is the same as logic. The view is the hard to test dependency and the controller is the humble object that orchestrates the work between the logic and the view, the hard to test dependency. And here with this MVC pattern, you also are able to test your uh, model independently from the view, which is hard to test. Um, and the controller is there just to orchestrate the work between the two. And so in the end, we have this picture uh, where uh, we need to unit test the domain model and algorithms. We need to skip test coverage of the trivial code altogether. And we need to cover our controllers with the integration tests. And uh, as for the overcomplicated code, we need, ideally you shouldn't have any. Ideally you should uh, split it into either algorithms or controllers. And um, this framework uh, with the four components of a good unit test, this framework provides you uh, with a good frame of reference and you can view all uh, a lot of existing um, ideas or uh, patterns in unit testing using that framework. For example, the test pyramid that we all know um, can also be viewed from, uh, from the perspective of these four components. Um, here, uh, for example, unit tests give you the best the fastest feedback and the best maintainability because they run in memory and they are small and that's why they are maintainable. But on the other hand, end-to-end -end tests give you the best protection against bugs and the best resilience to refactoring. That's because uh, they, those tests execute a lot of code and not just your code, but also the code of external systems. And that's why they give you the best protection against bugs and um, the uh, best resilience to refactoring um, is because um, those tests are the most distant from implementation details. They are as distant as possible uh, from those implementation details. And integration tests are somewhere in the middle. So this is, um, so this is about how to write effective, uh, effective tests and let's now discuss uh, when you should and when you shouldn't use mocks. So mocks uh, are a type of test double that help you to split the dependency graph so that you don't have to instantiate all those dependencies when you test some class. And this is quite helpful um, uh, because you are able to just supply this class with its immediate dependencies and don't instantiate the dependencies of those dependencies to test this class. So uh, to dis discuss where and uh, where you should and where you shouldn't use mocks, we need to discuss different types of dependencies. Dependencies can be categorized uh, into two buckets. The first one is mutable dependencies or collaborators. And the second one is immutable dependencies. Mutable dependencies can also be categorized into out-of-process dependencies and in-process dependencies. Out-of-process mutable dependencies are 
something like a database or a file system. And in process, mutable dependencies is something like um, just an entity. So for example, uh, uh, as we discussed, if you test a user class and this user class depends on a mutable company class, that company class would become an in-process mutable dependency. And the same is for immutable dependencies. They can also be categorized into out-of-process and in-process dependencies. So an example of an out-of-process immutable dependency is some API service that allows you to read some data but doesn't allow you to modify that data. And an in-process dependency immutable in-process dependency is a value or a value object. So a number five, an example with a number five is exactly that. It's an example of an immutable in-process dependency, a value. And there are two schools of thought when it comes to marking. The first one is the London school and the second one is the classic school. The London school tells us that we need to replace all mutable dependencies with marks. And uh, the classic school tells us that we need to replace only out of process dependencies, out of process mutable dependencies with marks. And both of these schools are incorrect in their treatment of marks. Let's first discuss why the London school is incorrect and then we'll uh, come back to the classic school. All uh, types of all communications in your system can be categorized into uh, categories in two types. The first one is external communications, and the second one is internal communications. Internal communications is when your uh, domain classes communicate with each other. So, uh, again, this example between the user and the company class is an example of internal communication. An external communication is when your system communicates with external applications, such as the message bus. <coughs> and um, so, uh, uh, internal communications between your classes are implementation details. And that's because um, it doesn't matter for the clients of your system how exactly your classes communicate with each other, as long as the end result that they produce is correct. And so when you bind to those communication patterns, uh, uh, you, are, uh, you are binding to those implementation details. So you shouldn't uh, test those uh, you shouldn't um, uh, check the communication pattern between the classes, between individual classes inside your system, because they are not part of the observable behavior of your system. So that's why the London School is incorrect. That's because it's because uh, you shouldn't mark in process mutable dependencies. You shouldn't replace them with marks. And uh, the classic school is incorrect because just like the, uh, the internal communications are implementation details, communications with some external systems are also implementation details. And to see why, well, here, for example, uh, I displayed, uh, I showed the uh, application database and that is a database that is accessible to only your application. Uh, that's the database that, is, uh, that, any, that no external applications can see. Uh, only your application can access it. And uh, communication with such a database will also be an implementation detail. And to explain why, we need to uh, talk about how different systems evolve together during their development. So uh, the main component of such an evolution between uh, two developing systems is backward compatibility. Backward compatibility is uh, maintaining uh, the communication pattern between these two systems. So basically between your system and uh, the um, out of process dependency. It means that if you, um, regardless of how you refactor your code, this, uh, your application shouldn't change the way it talks to external systems. So for example, if your application puts messages on a bus, even if you do a lot of refactorings, you shouldn't change the format of those messages because external systems will not understand those messages if you change them. And that's, um, um, so that's the essence of backward compatibility and why the backward compatibility itself is important is because uh, you cannot deploy your application together with other applications that depend on your application. That could be because, uh, for example, uh, this other application 
uh, is developed by another team in your company and that team has a different deployment schedule or it could be because you just don't have control over that um, uh, second system and you have to maintain backward compatibility in order to keep this second system operational so that it uh, keeps understanding your system. And mocks are great for this. Mocks are great uh, when you want to uh, solidify the communication pattern between your system and those out of process dependencies. Those out of process dependencies uh, that cannot be deployed together with your system. But the database is not such a dependency because uh, the database is not accessible to external applications and you can uh, deploy this database together with your application. So you should you don't need to maintain backward compatibility with external applications uh, with, with these uh, uh, with these types of dependencies with the database. Um, so, uh, for example, you can uh, because external applications don't see uh, this database they do not see how exactly you communicate with that database. And um, you can, for example, modify, uh, refactor your uh, storage, your, your database, or you can replace, uh, you can even replace your SQL storage with a NoSQL storage. And as long as the uh, end result, the observable behavior is the same, clients wouldn't even notice that. And that's why you shouldn't, maintain backward compatibility with those dependencies and you shouldn't use marks to, uh, to uh, check the communication pattern between your application and those dependencies. Communication with such out of process dependencies are also implementation details. And so this is why uh, the classic school is incorrect. That's because not all out of process mutable dependencies should be replaced with marks. Uh, we need to subdivide those types of dependencies into two subcategories, managed and unmanaged dependencies. Managed dependencies are out of process dependencies, communications with which are not visible to external applications. So for example, uh, application database or a file system. And unmanaged dependencies are out of process dependencies, communications with which are visible to external systems. So a typical example here is a message bus, because when you put a message on a bus, then this message, then this message becomes visible to external applications. That's basically the reason why you put that message on this bus. And only unmanaged dependencies should be replaced with marks. You shouldn't replace managed dependencies with marks. All right, so that's basically all I have for today. Um, this is again my book, uh, my website, and we can discuss any questions. Hello. Hey, that's questions. great. Does anyone have any questions for Vlad? Uh, go ahead, Sean. Yeah, thanks. I just have a question. Um, you know, one takeaway I'm bringing from this talk is maybe not use spies. It seems like spies are not encouraged because they're too um, close to the implementation like you were talking about. Is there ever a good time to use spies or do, do you just recommend not using them at all? Uh, there are different um, definitions of what the spy is. Uh, my definition, I took it from the, uh, I, I, I always forget the author's name. So the book is X Unit Patterns. Uh, and the author of this book categorizes test doubles into five subcategories. So uh, marks, spies, stops, dummies, and something else, I forget. Well, uh, basically they, uh, they can be subdivided into two uh, categories, marks and stops. And marks uh, include in, a, in themselves in the definition of a mark and a spy. So, his definition, at, my, at least to my understanding, is that uh, a mark is some construct that, um, that you create using some marking library, whereas a spy is basically the same thing, but you write it yourself. So it's basically a handwritten, uh, a handwritten mark. So that's the difference between a spy and a mark. And um, basically there are no other differences other than this implementation detail and uh, all these, um, uh, guidelines that I 
described, they can also be applied to spies as well as marks. But maybe your definition of spy is different. So uh, what do you mean by spy? Because different authors mean different things by all those types of test doubles. Um, yeah, thanks. I think when I think of spies, I usually think of code that checks to see if a method was called with like certain parameters or something like that. Right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, basically it's the same as mock. Uh, uh, the only reason, uh, the only difference is that you write it yourself without the help of a mock library, mock and library. And yeah, all the all the same um, uh, guidelines apply there as well. Yep. Basically, you should only use mocks or spies for unmanaged out of process dependencies in order to avoid test fragility. I hope it's clear. If not, let's discuss further. No, I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Uh, when you're talking about databases about being in process, I think um, you, you, you have a certain uh, model in mind. I have, I'm working on a software project where we have an older version of the code and we have a newer, a newer completely separate product, but they talk to the same database. And that's required because they need to cooperate and uh, we need to, we can't bring the whole new one up, up at the same time. So we're trying to replace functionality the old one with functionality the new one until we can get rid of the old version. Yep, um, and let me bring up a picture. Did I miss something there? No, no, no. It's a good question. Yeah, I just, I'm just um, need to find a picture that illustrate this exact idea. Uh, well, you're basically describing uh, a, a database which is both managed and unmanaged dependency. So hope you can see this picture. Yeah. So this is the situation usually uh, when you have a legacy database and uh, it's not only accessible by your application but external applications can also access that database. And you can tackle this by separating uh, this database into two parts, the unmanaged part, which is visible to other applications and managed part which is visible to only your application and you need to treat this part as an as an unmanaged dependency and you need to replace it with marks whereas uh, you need to test this part which is not visible to other applications directly with your application so uh, basically this uh, when you integration test your application you will check the state of this part of your database but you will check uh, the communication pattern with this part of the database. And that's basically because uh, this part of the database becomes part of the contract. It, uh, it's, it, it becomes um, a contract between your application and other applications that communicate with your application through uh, these tables. And because it's part of the contract, you need to make sure that you don't change that contract when you refactor your code. And for that, as I said, uh, the best a uh, tool is the use of marks. Okay, thank you. That answers it perfectly. And by the way, I have another picture on the difference between marks and stubs. Uh, and just to elaborate on the previous question. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, Gerald, I cannot pronounce his last name, but Gerd uh, in his book, um, uh, X-Unit Test Patterns, he provided five uh, definition, uh, five types of test doubles, dummy, stop, spark, spy, mock, and fake. And they are, the differences between them are not that significant. Uh, basically they can all be categorized into two categories, mocks and stops. And the difference between those is that a mock is something that uh, checks the outgoing or outcoming interaction with the dependency. And the stop is something that emulates the incoming uh, interaction with the dependency. So for example, when your system sends an email, that would be an outgoing interaction. And the resulting 
uh, test double is gonna be a mock. And when you stop a database, that's gonna be an incoming interaction and the resulting test double will be a stop. So basically that's the only difference. Uh, we have a message in chat. Uh, um, I'm not going to try to say a name for a managed dependency. If operation is inserting data into a table, should we delete slash clean data as well? Yes, yes, we should, because all tests should be independent from each other in terms of test data. Um, so uh, those tests will likely not be able to run in parallel. Uh, well, you, you actually can do that, but it's too hard usually. And I personally wouldn't recommend that you uh, make those tests um, uh, runnable in parallel uh, just because of, of the sheer effort that requires you to enable that. So you can, uh, you, you will most likely run them uh, in sequence, sequentially, but uh, they still should be independent from each other in terms of the test data that they use. So they should create all the test data before uh, the test, and they should also clean up uh, any test data. And the way to do that, so there are several ways to do so. So for example, one, um, but only one good way. So uh, the bad ways to clean up test data would be to, for example, create a transaction, database transaction, and then roll back that transaction. Another way is to clean up after the test. Um, and both of these ways are bad because your test may fail for any reason. And if it cleans up data after the test, then this cleanup stage may be just skipped. Um, uh, and uh, this test data will interfere with the subsequent test runs. And uh, the, um, the option with the database transaction is bad because it creates an environment that doesn't emulate the environment of your production. Because in production, you don't have this database, this ambient database transaction that is sitting there. And uh, you shouldn't do this in your test environment because uh, you should uh, strive to emulate the production environment as closely as possible. And this database transaction that you create on top of your, uh, uh, of your test execution interferes with that principle. So the best way to clean your test data is before the test run. And that uh, solves all the issues because you're, able, uh, because you're, you're not able to skip that stage and um, uh, uh, so, and you don't need to create any uh, database transactions on top of your test execution. Okay. I have a question my own following up on that. We have systems, we have tests in our, in, in my environment where they actually write and modify the database. And what happens is the tests get in one version in our, um in the next version in the next version and if two builds go on at the same time there's a very small window when you do the setup of the test and you do the test you do the, before you do the tear down where you can get inconsistent state because the database will be one test will be tearing down the stuff that the other one's trying to test yeah, that's why you you don't uh, run your tests in parallel. Tests, at least tests that uh, yeah. uh, that work with the database. Um, that's a problem with a lot of uh, legacy projects. I work currently on a project that also has this problem because the database um, it's an old Oracle database that you cannot easily replicate on the development on the development environment. And uh, yeah, it's a pain to run integration tests on that database. Uh, but ideally what you should do is you should have a separate database instance uh, for each developer so that they can run their uh, tests independently from all other database instances. And that brings up a whole set of questions of how exactly you should manage uh, the database structure uh, consistently and uh, for that, uh, we can. Uh, you need to use um, the so-called migration-based database delivery, so that you don't just uh, modify your database, your test database on the fly. You create a migration that is applied during uh, deployment where, with the deployment of a new code, and this migration should uh, modify your uh, the structure of your database. Uh, uh, also. Uh, during deployment so that you don't, well, basically 
<clears throat> basically, you need to keep all those modifications in separate files called migrations. Uh, those are SQL scripts. And uh, so that all developers have the same um, structure of their development database so that they can keep that development uh, database in sync with each other. Thank you. So are you thinking of products like Flyway or Liquibase to do those types exactly. of migrations? Is DB that what you up, had in mind? DB up, yep, exactly, yeah. You can also uh, uh, write it yourself. It's actually a really simple um, utility. Uh, maybe write it yourself just for educational purposes, but don't use it in production uh, because uh, how exactly to manage those migrations and how to run them, it's a good exercise that you may want to implement, but not, don't, uh, you don't necessarily have to uh, use that code that you write in production after that. I see, thanks. Do you go into uh, testing processes using things like uh, property-based testing rather than example-based testing? Do you talk about that at all? Uh, not in the book, uh, but it's a good, it's an interesting technique. Uh, so basically the idea is that you find properties in your software, in your, um, basically your business logic that you can test independently of the exact uh, sample data argument, uh, basically test data that you supply to your uh, business logic. So uh, uh, the most prevalent, the most uh, widely known example is um, the function of reversing a list. So here you can uh, reverse uh, the list two times. And the property is that the initial list should be the same as the, um, uh, the final list after two reversions after two consequent reversions. And that's the, proper, the property of this reverse, uh, revert uh, function, that it reverts it such that uh, it, uh, the list comes back to the initial state. And you can test this property independently of the list itself, of the content of the list itself. Um, and so, yeah. Um, the problem with this approach, with the property-based testing, uh, there are two problems, really. Uh, the first one is that it doesn't really work that well with uh, non-functional programming languages. So it works best in languages like Scala, Haskell, F Sharp, and it doesn't work that that well in Java and C Sharp because uh, in Java and C Sharp we usually write stateful code. So we write classes that can keep a state inside of it. Um, so that uh, and that state can change over time. And uh, property-based testing doesn't work really well with this type of code. Uh, it usually works uh, well enough only with code without any side effects. So with basically functional programming. Uh, and another problem with property-based testing is that it's not that easy to identify the, all those properties. Even if you, um, let's say, make your code functional uh, in terms of as in functional programming. So if you, even if you make your code functional without any side effects, it's still not that easy to identify all those properties to test. Uh, and so it may be hard to rely on property-based testing exclusively, maybe in some property, in some parts of your system, but still you will have to um, supplement it with the regular example-based testing. Right, that's what I'm finding as well. Like uh, I was writing the other day some uh, code that will, well, I'll just give an example. I was parsing JSON and I also had some other code that would generate JSON. And then I would just write code that would just take a random message, generate the JSON from it, take that output, parse it right back, and then I would just assert, did I get the same thing back after a round trip? And uh, sometimes you can actually pair things and that works well. And another example would be like a sorting algorithm where you can generate the code, the data randomly, and you can verify that it's in sorted order uh, after you, you've done the sort. And that way you verify that it did in fact 
sort. Yeah, but with the second example, you actually uh, need to be careful not to rely on on the knowledge of the production code of how to actually sort this code. Uh, right. Because, yeah, and it's right. really hard to do that. You basically want right, to because what happens is sorting. your test is just repeated. Exactly, it's just yes. repeating the code that's in the implementation. Yeah, and it's, it's right. one of the anti-patterns that I mentioned in the book. I called it um, leaking domain knowledge to tests. It's when you repeat uh, the content of your production code in tests. In the test, right. Yeah. You're just doing the same thing. But, uh, but in certain cases, you can be careful about that. I notice it is kind of possible to do these things. I've been experimenting a bit with that, where you try to write, uh, keep your data in your and the operations that affect the data separate, and you refactor that, and so you create objects, but they're immutable objects, and you pass those around, and then you write a separate class that just takes those that those immutable data classes and then produces a new set of immutable output classes and then now your your functions become pure functions and that makes it much easier to test uh, that way if you can write your object oriented code in a functional style and what happens is i find your if you're not working in a functional programming language you can do it but it becomes very wordy let's say you have to write yeah. an awful lot of boilerplate to be able to accomplish it but it is possible to do it yeah yeah um and it's a good uh, practice uh, I, I don't think we have time to show it but in the book i also showed an example of how you can refactor um a code that modifies let's say files uh, into these functional style, into pure functions, uh, where they don't modify those files themselves, but they generate uh, instructions for uh, the modification later. And then you can check not the content of those files or the marks that modify those files, but the content of those instructions, of those immutable instructions, and the tests become much easier to maintain uh, as a result of it. Yep. Right. I think that's starting to approach the concept of an I.O. monad. <laughs> what you're really doing is you're not modifying the state. What you're doing is you're generating the sequence of instructions that would yep. modify the state, and you're asserting that you're generating the right sequence of instructions. And as long as you're generating the right sequence of instructions, you're okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's basically yeah. this the humble... Idea this humble object uh, once yeah. again, it's when you- Yeah, it's it's borrowing the same concept there. Yeah, and the humble object will apply those instructions to external dependencies later. Right. Do you do anything with, uh, with like, when I think of spies, I'm thinking of term, in terms of like logging. So you put in a dependency in there and it's just gonna log all of the interactions that you know, you're using on that dependency and then you just verify the log uh, when you come back and say, yep, okay, it, it, it did the right things to this dependency. So therefore, I guess I'm happy. That's yeah, sort of well, it's, it's basically the same as mock, uh, just uh, because with mocks, you also can verify uh, that not only a certain method was called, but it was called with a certain set of parameters. It's basically the same as spy, but with spy, you do this manually. Uh, you write uh, those parameters down to some private state and then check that private state afterwards. Um, right. What I find I do is I used to use uh, mocks where you'd use a mocking library or something like that, but I discovered uh, I actually don't need to do it. Uh, you can write uh, what I call stubs and you just implement the interface that describes your dependency. And you just you can just inject that in, and then you just make the assertions just right in your code, rather than re rely on a mocking library that's, you know, it, it uses a feature in Java called reflection. And when you can get rid of all of that reflection and, and speed that up, and you don't have to use the reflection properties by just putting in what I call a stub. You just implement an interface and all the, the methods are just trivial. I mean, they like 
return null or something like that, except for the one that you want to actually test. And then you might have a counter and then verify the parameters on that one method uh, of, that, of that interface. And, and, and it returns out you know, the, the data that you want it to return and just verify, okay, I called it with these. And then I got the, the output that I expected was all it really turned out to be. And then, then you know, I, my philosophy is fewer dependencies is better. Yep. And, now I've, and now I've eliminated a dependency on a mocking library uh, when I can do that. Yeah, um, the, in terms of maintainability, there are, uh, the differences between mocks and spies are really small, but still there are some differences. And mm -hmm. um, in, in the book, I also showed that. So um, the main difference here is that with spies, you can make your code more maintainable in some situations where, um, where with mocks, you will have to basically repeat some of the uh, assertions uh, with, with spies, you can um, extract those repeatable parts into that spy class, then reuse those assertions. And that will make your tests uh, look, uh, well, they, it will make them more maintainable because it will reduce their size. So yeah. Uh, That's right. I, I'll actually put my assertions inside of my little mock class yep. rather than outside and make assertions on the, on the, uh, on the mock through the library, I just put it in the code that I write, and that, that can that can make the code really nice to look at. I see there's a hand raised there. Uh, Kyle, you had your hand up. Yes, uh, I wanted to like ask a question on from it's a question about chapter seven in the book where you talk about when you end up introducing conditional logic in your controller, as you call it, the humble object. How to avoid that, like. Because the one difficulty I find that I run into a lot is that you can end up with a controller that gets fatter and fatter and then fatter, and then with conditional logic, or I guess where your approach is to, I know like there's like, I see the two approaches where like you push all your external reads and writes to the edges, but sometimes that is not the most performant because you have to maybe based on a result in Result of the logic you're doing, you have to do pretty hefty database calls. And depending on like the permutations of that result, you can have to do a lot of calls up front. Um, so I see that as a big downside of that approach. Uh, so yeah, the, the choice is basically between these two usually. So uh, they, uh, just for others, um, we're talking about how to test controllers uh, if those controllers have a lot of conditional logic. And uh, so uh, let's say uh, when, your, when your controller just does some reads and then does some writes to, to the database or other out of process dependencies, then it's easy to test this controller because uh, you just push those reads and writes to the edges and, and that's basically it. You, you can uh, test it in a purely functional way. But what if some of the logic uh, of the controller depends on um, some intermediate step and you have to basically test those steps individually or you have to include that out of process dependency into the business logic la layer as a external dependency. Um, and this as a result gives us these three options between controller simplicity, performance, and uh, the stability of your domain model where you can uh, still push your external reads and writes to the edges of the business operation. And that will give you controller simplicity because your controller uh, will be simple. Um, so without any conditional logic and uh, the domain model will remain testable. Uh, but it will uh, does it will do this at the expense of performance. Another two options here are injection of those out of process dependencies into the domain model, which uh, which will impede the stability because your domain model will now have a dependency on out of process dependency, uh, but will preserve uh, performance and controller simplicity. And the option that I recommend usually uh, is. Uh, still split your decision-making process 
So basically make your controller more complex. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so that's that would that would I would recommend. Uh, and uh, this option would result in controller complication. So we don't have controller simplicity here because this controller will have a logic. But in my opinion, it's the worst option of the three um, uh, because uh, you will be able to test that logic with integration tests. Uh, but if you put your dependency after process dependency to your domain model, the domain model will basically become untestable and I wouldn't recommend to ever do that. I have another set of articles on that specific topic. I don't know if you check this, but let me put it in the chat. This. Yeah, I think I, I was I think I was looking at this diagram wrong originally. I, I I guess I wasn't looking at it as you can't maximize all three. I was trying to get to a point where I was trying to maximize all three points. Yeah, uh, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I see that now. I was looking at that wrong. So thanks for uh, clarifying that. Yeah. And also uh, check out the link that I put in the chat. It basically um, describes the same thing, uh, but in. Um, yeah, it's actually uh, two, it's actually a series of articles, uh, three articles where uh, it dives deeper into this topic in subsequent articles. So, yeah. Great, sweet, also, thank you. Yeah, I got this pulled up. Yep, and we also had some questions in the chat. What do you think about automated mutation testing in general, uh, such as PyTest? Um, it's a good tool to identify your uh, coverage, uh, your uh, basically how good your coverage is. Uh, so it's a good supplement to your test coverage metrics. But as a, uh, so, yeah, you basically you can use it to uh, identify how good your test coverage is. But other than that, I don't see much use in that. Uh, particular practice, but still, it's a good tool to um, to identify the the completeness of your test coverage, so to speak. Um, so, a question about demo code in my blogs. Uh, yes, it's all in C sharp, but it's still similar to Java. So, um, and usually, I describe topics that are not C sharp specific. So, uh, yeah, you can just. Replace C sharp with Java in your mind, and it should be the same. On top of that, I wouldn't recommend letting your controller get fatter instead pass the functionality to the service. Well, it doesn't really make a difference. So um, it's a continuation of this discussion where we suffer, where we give up controller simplicity uh, for the main model testability and performance. So the, the idea is to introduce another class called service that would uh, take up all the complexity from the controller. It doesn't really make any difference because that class also becomes a controller in a sense. Um, so, yeah. If you write <laughs> the code correctly, you don't need tests. True, true. <laughs> It helps if you use a programming language where the compiler can check uh, whether yeah, your code is correct by construction. And there's a lot of research that's being done in programming language, new programming languages where uh, what would normally be something that you would have to write a unit test for uh, turns into something that just flat out will not compile because it's a type error. And if your type system is sophisticated enough, you can actually describe the functionality in enough detail where if it's not doing what you want, the compiler finds it and it can never, you don't even have to write the test and it can never even make it into production. Yeah, that's still an ongoing research topic. You know what they say, testing can, can prove the presence of a bug but it can never prove the absence of all bugs. Exactly. And there's yeah. no way to generate an exhaustive 
combinatorial every single possible combination that could happen because that would take more time than the universe has been in existence to exhaustively test every pattern. Yeah, um, just wanted to share. Yeah, basically at the type system, uh, yeah, I had no article on, on that topic. So basically at the type system, uh, you should prefer the type system to, co to check correctness, then uh, code contracts, and then uh, unit tests. That's right, the right. Because the type system, if it's sophisticated enough, can define the contract. Or at least mm -hmm. that's, that's what I've seen. Yeah, I, I haven't even seen this article, but yeah, I think we're getting at the same point. Uh, I think you have some other questions here about the difference between an integration test and a unit test. Yeah, uh, so basically the difference, I in the book, I put it this way. Let me pull this up. So basically this is the difference. Uh, you, um, yeah, let me maybe first provide a formal definition. So a unit test is a test that verifies a single unit of behavior, does it quickly and does it in isolation from other tests. It's really, it will take us another half an hour to elaborate, but this is the short definition. And an integration test is a test that is not a unit test. So basically all tests can be categorized into unit and integration tests. And the simplified version is basically this one. So if we put our uh, code into these four quadrants, then unit tests are tests that cover the mail model and algorithms and integration tests are tests that cover the controllers. So basically the difference is that unit tests will not have to work with out of process dependencies or mocks and integration tests will have to work with um, out of process dependencies or mocks. So to follow up a little bit on that, I want to bring up the, the question of the environment in which your tests run. So you'll have a developer machine and you'll have a local copy of, let's say it's some big database like Oracle or something on your local machine and your developer is testing on that. But then uh, you've also got some automated system. You've got uh, Jenkins running somewhere, and it's uh, being shared by a whole bunch of developers. Well, what happens is uh, when you start checking all that code in, you know, you're trying to automate this, so you check it into GitHub or some, some equivalent thing, and then that's going to kick off Jenkins or something, and it's going to start running all that test. But then when multiple developers all start kicking in their code, well, then it's all going to run against that shared database again. Yeah, that's And I don't know that's... how you keep that all isolated uh, when you're, when you're, you know, when, when suddenly it's all running in the same environment again. That's the problem Ted mentioned, yes. Uh, you shouldn't use one database for that stuff. You shouldn't share a database for, uh, for these test runs. So um, uh, the Jenkins environment should have its own database instance and each developer should have their own database separate database instance that's the only way to isolate that and as i mentioned in my pro in my current project we don't have that because the database is legacy and it's really hard to create uh, new instances of that database and so we have to share a database that is uh, on um, that is used for automated tests with our own tests that we run on our machines. And yeah, that's a pain. The only way to avoid this is to have separate instances. Right, and then you get into all the licensing issues of how many instances you can <laughs> have. And yeah, it, it, I, can, I can see where that can be uh, well, really a, a lot problematic. Of, uh, some of, at least some of the databases um, can run in Docker right uh, at the moment, uh, yeah. in today's day. For example, SQL Server for all databases, they uh, provide, uh, they have a Docker image. And so it's really, uh, it's become really easy to run a SQL Server instance. I'm not sure about Oracle though. I didn't try it. <laughs> yeah, it'd be nice if you could run that in a Docker, because then I can see if you could get a Jenkins thing and it just kicks off a separate thing and it's all just in Docker and they're all running independently of each other, then you're, you're in, at least in better shape. 
Still yeah, not going to be as fast as just, you know, writing some simple unit test codes. It's just testing some business logic because Oracle is going to take a while to start up. Yeah, it's and uh, the prob problem here is that you will need to maintain those Docker images. Uh, what I meant is um, you don't need to install it on each developer's machine. Manually, you can just download it as a Docker image and then use it oh. as your SQL instance. Uh, but on the on the uh, Jenkins environment, yes, you will still have to work with one instance. That instance can run in Docker, but I wouldn't recommend to spin up new instances for, let's say, each test run, because it's really hard to maintain those Docker images uh, with the correct state, with the correct database version, and so on and so forth. It's much easier to just maintain one database instance uh, uh, that is um, devo devoted for Jenkins, and that's it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I see a lot of people here and I wonder how they tackle that problem uh, with their production systems. I mean, especially when you're dealing with a lot of big data, you know, for these large enterprise systems, uh, that can that can be a real issue. Does anybody yeah. else have any questions? I don't want to monopolize Vlad here. Sharing the database could be fine if that's just uh, read-only access, like in big data. Uh, but if you want to write data there, then yeah, it's become, it becomes a problem. Is there any advantage in testing this if you're looking at like uh, separating that out into command query responsibility segregation? It depends on the project, on how um, much functionality you have in, let's say, the read part of your application versus the write part. Uh, because usually, even if you apply this pattern, the CQRS pattern, it doesn't make sense to separate it into separate applications. It's still in one application, and uh, you, you usually need to test both sides still. Uh, but if, for example, um, you have some complex um, indexing, or some, some complex read functionality with querying, complex read queries, then maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe you, have, you can just have one instance of that read part of your application and just uh, test it out um, and share it between developers. Okay. Do you have anything in your book about these event-based type systems where you're just passing events around and messages and things like that as far as good strategies for testing those? Uh, yeah, so I call that domain events. Uh, it's not the main part of the, uh, it's not the, the main focus of the book, but it's basically one of the techniques of how you can uh, handle uh, complexity in controllers. Uh, so for example, when, um, when you need to put messages on a bus in, in case of some event, let's say user, the simplest example is when a user changes their email address. And uh, this event should be um, communicated to downstream applications. And so um, uh, you can represent it as a domain event that you keep in your uh, user class as just a collection of events. And then, um, after the uh, use case, after the operation is completed, you just check all the events that accumulated, that are accumulated by your uh, domain classes. And then if there are any, you dispatch them at the end of the business transaction. Um, so yeah, that's the easiest way to tackle events in your domain model. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Sean says, uh, it sounds like having separate databases is best, but if you can't, maybe transactions are the least worse alternative. Um, I would say the least worse alternative is to just uh, maybe uh, create your test data such that it doesn't interfere with the test data of other people. So may maybe introduce some variability in, um, in the e emails. If let's say you have an index in the database that checks for email, email uniqueness, you can uh, just put a um, uh, unique ID as part of that email so that it doesn't uh, trigger the index violation exception. So stuff like that.
how useful do you find uh, logging uh, in all of this when it comes to you know identifying bugs? Because it's just almost inevitable something's going to slip in, and you're and you're going to see something in your log file. Hopefully, you've at least logged some problematic transaction or event that's that's happened. Do you have any thoughts as far as how much logging you should put in? Because yeah. you put in too much, it's just going to create voluminous log yeah, files, it's... right? And slow down your system. But if you don't do enough, you can't find where the where the problem happened. Yeah, it's a, it's a debatable topic. I personally, uh, I don't like logs. Uh, it's like comments. Uh, if you have comments, you just didn't write your code clear enough. Uh, but when you have an issue that you cannot figure out, those logs can really be useful. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know if if the code is simple, clear, not legacy, then maybe you can get away with fewer logs, maybe even almost no logs. But if the code is complex and you cannot easily refactor it, make it simpler, then yes, say you probably should have more logs to. Uh, to check what happens if something goes wrong. Okay. Any thoughts on performance testing to make sure that your system is running fast enough? I mean, we have tools like JMeter and things like that, and you can time stuff, uh, particularly if certain operations are time sensitive. Yeah, um, I would personally rely more on logging of that uh, performance. So. If we're talking about uh, performance testing as just a separate activity that is not part of the build pipeline, that is fine. But I personally wouldn't include it into the automated build pipeline, at least uh, in a typical enterprise level application where uh, performance is not that critical, uh, because that would just uh, uh, slow down the pipeline significantly. And if uh, I would personally rely more on the logs because uh, with logging, you can uh, put alerts such that if some operation, let's say some critical operation becomes slower, uh, it can trigger you, uh, it can trigger an event, uh, an uh, alert for you to investigate. That would be um, a least intrusive way to monitor and to uh, keep performance in check. Okay. And any thoughts on like security testing uh, to make sure that the systems that you develop are, you know, not too easy for somebody to hack into? <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's, it's possible to automate those things. Um, okay. Although I'm not that knowledgeable in the space of security testing. Maybe it is, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I don't have okay. that much experience. All right. Well, thank you for a great presentation. I'm not seeing. Oh, here we've got a few more. What's your take on uh, James Copeland's definition of a unit test? Is covering a unit of externally verifiable work as contrasted testing every method on a Java class, etc. But that can I, I just my reaction to that is testing every method on a Java class is just like testing getters and setters. It's just that's trivial stuff that wouldn't give you a whole lot of value, but, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, exactly. So uh, you shouldn't test. Um, here just for one minute. I know your thoughts are a little bit that you might be a little negative for this. But okay. the fact that I had to write voluminous setters and getter tests on collections. And I'm talking about where I had gigs of memory in Java. And yes, we found errors. We had unit tests that ran against it for a stateful set of data coming in from a database where we had to check the state. Therefore, we built up the data set in the database, we tested it, and we tore it down. But it was necessary to prove the functionality that the business wanted. Yes, it existed, and it does help. And these are getters and setters. They were basically POJOs okay. inside of the collection that had to make sure that the set that the state of the POJO existed in such a condition. 
Uh, I see you're testing the state of the list. Yes. As a a whole. In other words, it had to match coming from the business logic that existed in the stored procedure that came from the SAP system. It had to be validated that the logic was picked up, programmatically handled correctly, not lost, and proved that that state of the data existed. Oh, I see. I have a question. Yeah, and, and, and we're not even going to get into the problem that uh, Java's collections libraries violate the Liskov substitution principle. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going I mean, there. I'm, I'm, I'm not happy prove. about that. And I actually complained about that to Josh Block, who was the author of those. You know, that, is, that was not a good design, in, in my opinion. I feel your pain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have to do all this copying that he talks about in Effective Java uh, because of that. Yeah. Abel, I thought maybe you're about to ask a question there. There's somebody was. Yeah, no, I actually uh, recently faced the same uh, issue in trying to like evaluate collections. And um, we ended up using something uh, that I, we found in GitHub called Hamcrest. I was wondering if Peter has like a better uh, tool that you guys use to evaluate those collections. <laughs> Sorry, no, we did it by hand. I'm not kidding you. I had <laughs> oh my God. so much freaking code at that point. I was working for a, uh, how can I say this? Mortgage provider. In other words, it's one of the big two. And um, the fact that we had to prove that when they accepted data coming in from the web from an Excel sheet, that they stuck into an SAP system that we had to pull it back out and prove that we did not have any illegal transactions coming from a mortgage supplier, so to speak. My and it, 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 it took, it took uh, I'm not kidding you. Uh, it took me three months to write the thing. Ooh, my condolences, man. <laughs> yeah, because you have to, I mean, I can see you got all kinds of problems that can that can happen when you're trying to validate input. You know, because you know, is the is the input into your system valid? Uh, that can that can be a real problem. We were, we were working against rules, rule sets, and basically running uh, the idea of truth tables inside of these tests to ensure the state of the data. And when I was writing it, I thought it was the stupidest thing I ever did. I had to write against all these getters and setters that I had to do this until we finally had to run it full blown and we found so many errors, it wasn't even funny. Wow. It wasn't, it wasn't the fact like we were, we had false positives or anything like this. It's the fact like we found problems that we didn't really anticipate taking an input of an Excel sheet or I guess a CBS file from the web and then assuming that we would always get correct data. We were assuming that we had some kind of valid process coming in. And when it hit SAP and we pulled it out of the stored procedures and we could not match anything up, it was ugly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tracing all that, yeah. Okay, any other questions? I'm just looking to see if we have anything more in chat or if anybody else has anything. Because if we don't, I think we're We'll be ready to move on and and uh, and do the raffle here. So I'm going to go ahead then, and I'll stop the recording here. <laughs>